it's, um, so I, I, let me just explain what the Grantham Research Institute is. It's a research centre at uh, London School of Economics and it's headed by uh, Nicholas Stern, who you may know uh, was the author of the um, influential 2006 study which uh, was published by the UK government on the economics of climate change and his major finding that the uh, costs of inaction on climate change far outweigh the costs of action of making a, a transition to a low carbon economy. And so we're, it's economics and social sciences, but I'm not an economist or a social scientist, I actually trained as a geologist, <coughs> but I've, I've spent much of my life working on, the, on uh, communication of issues, mainly on scientific issues. So that's why I'm at LSE helping the economists and social scientists with their, um, with their communication. Now the first thing to note is, and I'll emphasize this all the way through, is that climate change is an issue of both risks and opportunities, and that's the most important thing to take away from this, is that when you talk about climate change, both the risks and both the opportunities have to be part of that. The uh, picture on the left there is, the, uh, is from the flooding in the UK last winter, which I know you had Miles Allen here a few weeks ago talking about his research on attribution of extreme weather events. And one of the things that his research has found was that the uh, um, probability of an extreme rainfall event in the UK has increased by about 25% because of the elevated greenhouse gas levels which have raised temperature and therefore the atmosphere can hold more water the chances of, of more intense rainfall has increased by 25%. So you can attribute at least part of the events of last winter to climate change. But of course there is the opportunity story and, and I've got a picture there of, uh, of uh, a village in India where there are installed solar panels. And it's important to look at the example of Prime Minister Modi who came into power promising to bring electricity to 400 million people who don't currently have it to bring it to them partly with or largely based on solar power. And that shows you the uh, extent of opportunity in developing countries and in rich countries. But you have to emphasize both of this. To get to the right place on climate change, you have to recognize both the risks and the opportunities. So why communicate with the public? Well, I'm hoping this is kind of obvious, but I mean, what we need to do in order to um, manage the risks of climate change successfully and to seize those opportunities that are, uh, that are available is to uh, achieve a reduction in a rich country, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of between 60 and 90 percent compared to current levels over the next 35 years. Now that's going to be a huge challenge and it can't be done just by appealing to voluntary action by the public. It's going to require the government action, it's going to require uh, cooperation and support from all sectors, business, but also, of course, the public. And that's why it's very important to have the public on board, understanding the rationale behind these policies and to uh, support them. However, and certainly in the UK, what we've suffered Although there is relatively high levels of support for uh, dealing with climate change, there can be um, varying levels of support for individual measures, partly because of the confusion around the way in which they are communicated, misunderstanding and confusion about the scale and urgency of the problem. And it's the scale and urgency of the, of the problem that is where you have to start from when you think about climate change because it's that that tells you how much we've got to do and by when. Now greenhouse gas levels are already higher than they've been probably <coughs> for at least 800,000 years, probably for millions of years. That in itself should be a reason to be concerned. But what we're aiming for, if we just look at um, models, if we carry on with current rates of emissions for the end of the century, we're talking about changes in temperature that could be as much as five degrees or more by the end of the century. Now that doesn't sound very much compared to average daily changes in temperature, but five degrees is the difference between today's average temperature on Earth and the average temperature during the last ice age. We haven't seen five degrees warmer than today for tens of millions of years. Not just that we don't, we don't just not have any historical 
understanding of that. This lies outside evolutionary experience for human beings, which have only been around, modern Homo sapiens have only been around for 250,000 years. So anybody who says confidently we could deal with that is really speculating beyond that, uh, beyond any reasonable uh, limit. Now, one of the things that uh, is most important to get across to people is that the impacts take time to feed through and with many of these impacts, some of the most severe impacts, such as the uh, destabilization of the polar ice caps, could be irreversible. Indeed, there's already signs in the Antarctic, in West Antarctica, that you've started to see the erosion of the ice um, shelf, which essentially holds the glaciers into Antarctica. And they've gone, and the glaciers are pouring into the, into the uh, ocean there. Essentially, uh, what looks like an irreversible destabilization of West Antarctica, which, taken to its full limit, would add six to seven meters onto global sea level. So we have to worry about those things. That's why we have to act now before we see how far these impacts go, because once they are fully in motion, chances are we're not going to be able to reverse them, and they're going to have strong nonlinear effects such as uh, the methane <coughs> that could be released by melting permafrost, which would create a kind of feedback loop. And methane, as you know, is a very strong, powerful um, greenhouse gas. So although what might happen in the future is uncertain, they are the nature, these are risks. And the only way we will be able to prevent dealing with those impacts is if we take preventative action now. Otherwise, they'll become unavoidable. This is a graph from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's last report, and this shows the scale of the risks that we're facing. On the left-hand side are projections of temperature and the various emission scenario. The top one is what happens if you just carry on with accelerating greenhouse gas emissions. You'd be potentially up to five degrees more than uh, pre-industrial levels by the end of the century. But even at the lower levels, kind of weak mitigation scenarios, you've still got very significant changes, two or three degrees, again, well outside human experience. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you have something, the reason for concern diagram. It looks at five major impacts of climate change, or five categories of impact. And what that's showing you is essentially, if we get above about two degrees warmer than pre-industrial, and we're dealing with a whole range of potentially unacceptable risks, uh, not the least of which are the large-scale senior events such as uh, the uh, destabilization of the uh, ice sheet. So it's important to explain to people that because of the lag in the system, in the climate system, we're going to end, even if we stop emitting emissions overnight, we're still going to be dealing with the consequences of climate change for at least two or three decades. Uh, and that requires us to adapt to become more climate resilient. But in the long term, we won't just be able to adapt. If you talk about a uh, sea level rise of six or seven meters, albeit maybe over centuries, over millennia, but even two or three meters over the next century would be very significant. Currently, about 200 million people worldwide live within a couple of meters of sea level along the world's coast. Imagine trying to move them all within the next century. It would be a huge undertaking called massive uh, disruption. So governments have already agreed that the rise uh, of uh, global average temperature of more than two degrees would create unacceptable levels of risk. To give ourselves a 50% chance of avoiding a rise of more than two degrees means going from average annual, uh, going from annual emissions at the moment of uh, more than 50 billion tons to less than 20 billion tons by 2050. And that's the scale of the challenge we face. It's a huge undertaking, but it is achievable. Now, one of the, one of the real issues here is getting across to people, policymakers and the public, the scale of those risks. And it isn't always properly conveyed. So this is an example, again, from the um, summary for policymakers of the IPCC, the experts on climate change, produced. And that top sentence, equilibrium climate sensitivity, that's the temperature change, the long-term temperature change that would occur in response to a doubling of carbon dioxide levels in, in the atmosphere. 
is likely to lie in the range of one and a half to four and a half degrees. It said very unlikely greater than six degrees. Well, very unlikely means up to a one in 10 chance. A one in 10 chance that the doubling of CO2 would create a rise of more than six degrees in temperature. Now that is, in that language, that think, oh, well, it's very unlikely, it's very unlikely, therefore why bother? But if you compare that to the kind of risks that governments deal with, you know, we, in the UK, there's a, uh, a national risk register which categorizes different risks down to one in 20,000 chance. And here's a one in 10 chance, casually dismissed. And it isn't even built into the model. So what we see, even in the IPCC report, is arguably a conservative estimate of the risk. And that is not a very helpful way of helping policymakers and the public understand what's at stake here. So it's not always conveyed clearly the scale of the risks. Of course, the evidence of climate that uh, climate change is happening is clear and unambiguous. And I, I'm glad to hear that in, the, in Ireland there's... Um, less dispute goes on about the science behind it. We've seen a rise in global average temperature of uh, about 0.85 degrees, 13 of the 14 warmest years on record have all occurred since 2000. Here's an argument that is often made in the, in the UK, and that's the idea that global warming stopped in 1998. So what I've done is I've plotted temperature since 1970, global average temperature since 1970 on the left-hand side, so you can see a fairly good uh, upward trend. But what happens is people go and look at the last years since 1998, the last 17, um, 17, 16, 17 years, and they draw this much shallower graph. Then what they say is, well, we've only got 16 data points. It's not statistically significant. Therefore, global warming's zero. Therefore, it's stopped. It's a kind of duff uh, uh, kind of logic that unfortunately gets great play in our media uh, and the scientists have trouble arguing it down. But there's no real evidence that it's, it might have temporarily slowed down, but we've seen that throughout history those have happened. And, of course, the temperature record for Ireland reflects the global average temperature. That's the, uh, on the top, is uh, temperature from five stations in Ireland from your Met Office here since 1900. On the bottom, I've used the... Uh, stretched out um, global average temperature from the UK Met Office. And you can see this same pattern of a rise between 1900 and 1940, then a, a, a levelling off a slight depression, and then a pick up again in the 1970s. So Ireland is, uh, has all the evidence that climate change is happening. There. Now, from the economics point of view, climate change is a result of, um, of a series of market failures, the most serious of which is that uh, the price we pay for products and services that produce greenhouse gas emissions does not reflect the costs it imposes on, on everybody through climate change impacts. And that's a market failure that is, uh, Nick Stearns described as the largest market failure the world has ever seen. But it's not the only one. There are several other market failures that hold back alternative fossil fuels. Uh, the fact that R&D... Isn't uh, uh, usually high on the list of uh, companies because the spillover effects their competitors uh, earn from them are, are enormous. So you need public funding for that. Uh, capital markets generally uh, very short-sighted in their funding and access to networks, for instance, electricity networks hinder uh, new new uh, entrants. So for that reason, you need a whole host of different policies which address all of those market failures. You can't just rely on one. You can't just rely on carbon pricing, which is the uh, best response to the greenhouse gas externality, as the uh, economists call it. OK, so who should communicate? Well, it's not just climate scientists who should communicate. It's everybody, researchers in other fields, <laughs> the economists, governments and their agencies, international bodies, businesses. Businesses arguably hold the, uh, hold the answer here. If businesses, far-sighted businesses, spoke up more about how they are building climate change into their future, I think a lot of people will be persuaded. Those who make the argument that it would be economically too difficult to respond need to listen to what business is saying. The media, community and religious leaders, and I think the Pope's encyclical potentially is going to have a huge impact worldwide on, uh, 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 on uh, um, understanding of climate change. 
public, everybody needs to be involved. So what role should the media play? Well, the, in the UK, uh, the media um, is sort of divided. Broadcasters are required by law to be impartial in their reporting the news. Newspapers are essentially allowed to do whatever they want. They're self-regulated, and if you've been following self-regulation of the UK media, you'll see it's a shambolic mess at the moment. Um, but essentially what happens is that the uh, print media in particular treat uh, climate change not as a scientific issue but as a political issue and therefore they get to choose which side they want to be on or argue that they have to go for balance. In actual fact, the majority of the UK's national <coughs> newspapers now are sceptic to some point of view, which is amazing considering how strong the scientific consensus is. Here's an example uh, recently. This is from last September uh, when uh, the Mail on Sunday, which is one of our most widely read Sunday newspapers, published a news, uh, an article claiming that essentially um, Arctic sea ice has started regrowing again, amazingly. Uh, much more ice last summer than there were two years previously. Well, on the left is the graph showing the sea ice extent in the summer, and you'll see that it wriggles around a very distinct downward, downward trend. I complained about this article, and I've just heard from the media self-regulator that they found nothing wrong at all with the newspaper article, not a single thing wrong with it. Unbelievable. What, what impact does that have on the public, that kind of reporting by the newspapers that kind of either treats as false balance or even decides they want a skeptical viewpoint? Well, this is a... Uh, a um, survey results from last August for the UK public. It's asking what proportion of climate scientists do you think believe that climate change is mainly the result of human activities? And roughly 95% of climate scientists uh, uh, accept that position. And you'll see that the public believe that only 50, uh, that only 53% of the public believe that almost all um, scientists accept that fact. So there is a mismatch between what scientists actually think about climate change and what the public perceive uh, scientific opinion uh, is on this. When we talk about climate change, there are two major framings which are important here. I talked about uh, opportunity and risk, but there's one important one which tends to trip up a lot of the scientists, and that's uncertainty. And uncertainty has been used throughout uh, modern history by those who wish to resist regulation or legislation against their products and services in order to delay. And the most uh, obvious example of that was the tobacco industry, which used uh, doubts about the uh, link between smoking and lung cancer for many, many years to resist it. This is a, an extract from a document that was distributed by a Republican uh, lobbyist, a uh, pollster in the US. It was back in 2002, so during Bush's time, but it articulates very clearly a tactic that is still used today. And his advice to Republican activists in dealing with global warming was that voters believe that there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community, should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. That is why those who oppose action on climate change because they don't like the idea of regulating business try to make this about the science because they know that if they can make it uncertain, uh, create doubt in the minds of the public about the science, they don't have to then have an argument about regulation and legislation. And that is still a very, very powerful tactic that is used today. And the only way of really dealing with this properly is to make this about risk, because it's easy to say, if you're dealing with uncertain impacts, to say, well, let's wait and see what happens. But if what you're saying is these are risks, and the risks are growing every day as greenhouse gases goes up, then it's not a reasonable position to say, well, let's just let the risk accumulate before we do anything. We saw what happened in the uh, banking crisis, what happens when you do that. The other one, of course, is the burden versus opportunities. 
you know, having accepted that the risks is the action, is the cutting of greenhouse gas emissions a massive burden. That indeed is the way in which the UN fra uh, the Ra Framework Convention on Climate Change tends to view this. But actually, increasingly, it is recognised that how the action to cut greenhouse gas emissions will have lots of other economic co-benefits. This is what I think is the most powerful diagram from a report published last September, launched at the UN, uh, called the New Climate Economy Report. This shows the economic damage caused every year just by 2.5 micron particles from uh, the burning of fossil fuels. And essentially shows that in China they lose about 11% of GDP a year just through the action of those through local air pollution that reduces people's lives, make them unfit, uh, unable to work. So the kind of measures, like if you were to cut down the uh, uh, burning of coal and release, and this is indeed what China is understanding now, you will have huge multiple benefits beyond those of just the avoided climate risks. And that's a powerful argument why there are huge opportunities associated with that. This is my last slide. So this is bringing together those elements I've rattled through very quickly about uh, successful communication. So communication has to be everybody involved in that. And that means asking questions as well as giving answers. You need to be discussing what's happening here, understanding what the scale of and the urgency of the risk, what our options for, uh, for action are. Um, it is really important that people understand the scale of the risk. You cannot get to where you need to be if you don't understand what's at stake here. And we are really in a very difficult position. If we do not get a... a uh, a strong climate agreement in Paris at the end of this year, it is hard to see how we will be able to avoid global warming of more than two degrees, and we're into territory that humans don't know about and looks very risky indeed. Uh, you need multiple channels to communicate, and the traditional media have their shortcomings, um, and that's why increasingly new media are important to be able to convey directly to the public uh, the information they need that you need to talk about uncertainties in terms of their risks, because uncertainty is used by those who want to delay action to try and stop uh, moving ahead. People need to understand the co-benefits and all the other opportunities that arise from action. And most important of all, the power of the example, because what often you see at the moment is governments say they want to act, but they want to know they want to see what other people are doing first. And those who move first set a good example. That's why um, the news in the last week that China last year reduced its coal consumption by 2.9% and that its reduction in net emissions means that last year for the first time in recorded history, uh, carbon dioxide emissions from energy didn't go up between 2013 and 2014 without a worldwide global recession. Is it shows that we can get this done. It is possible. It's going to be a huge challenge. But we're already seeing the signs that we can achieve this, and that's really where we need to focus. Thank you.